making sense of EU. Welcome to Making Sense of EU, a podcast where scientific research sheds light on the pressing issues of EU affairs. Making Sense of EU is brought to you by the Institut d'Etudes Européennes of the Université Libre de Bruxelles. This series on inequality and the European Union is a product of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence EU Qualis, and it's co-funded by the European Union. My name is Maria Isabel Soldevila, and I am your host. One of the most polarizing topics in EU affairs today is the treatment asylum seekers get in the European Union. In this episode of Making Sense of EU, we will try to understand better the unequal treatment asylum seekers get in the framework of the Dublin system, as well as the ongoing process to reform it amid tragic events in the Mediterranean. We will also discuss the specifics surrounding the temporary protection Ukrainians have received since the beginning of the Russian invasion over a year ago. For this, we welcome Professor Philippe de Broeker, who is a lawyer specialized in European immigration and asylum law, free movement of European citizens and comparative aliens law. Professor de Broeker teaches and researches these fields at our institute and is founder and coordinator of the Odysseus Academic Network for Legal Studies on Immigration and Asylum in Europe. Thanks for joining us today. When it comes to human beings trying to enter the European Union, some political actors seem to actively mix up migrants, asylum seekers and refugees to serve their electoral agendas. Could you help us understand what are, in your view, the key points of immigration and asylum in the European Union that need urgent attention? From a legal point of view, there is a clear difference between migrants and refugees. Refugees are forced migrants. They do not have the choice to leave their country of origin because, for instance, they are persecuted. While migrants, for instance, economic migrants, have a choice to leave or to stay, even they are pushed to leave because, for instance, economic reasons, they are not really compelled like refugees. So it's a key element from a legal point of view to make a distinction between migrants and refugees. And unfortunately, nowadays, there is a trend to treat groups of persons which are called mixed groups because they are composed on the one hand of migrants and on the other hand of refugees. But unfortunately, there is a trend to treat them all as irregular migrants. What would you say are today the stakes involving both groups, migrants on one side and on the other side, asylum seekers? So, regarding asylum seekers, there is no choice for the European Union than to welcome them because they have a right to asylum. So, no discussion about who comes uh, or how many persons come as refugees. They must be welcome and they have the right to apply. Unfortunately, what we see nowadays more and more often by some member states of the European Union, like for instance uh, uh, Greece or Croatia or even Poland, is that what we see are prohibited pushbacks, refoulement, following the French work, at the border. People are sent back to a country where they are coming from and where they are not protected. So one main concern with refugees is that EU member states should go back to, like in the past they were doing, by respecting the principle of non-refoulement. We have recently witnessed once again tragedy in the Mediterranean this past June, with estimates that speak to of six to 700 deaths just in the coast of Greece. The handling of the situation ignited tensions between the Greek authorities and the EU agency Frontex over human rights violations. What does this tragedy say about the system in place to deal with migrants and refugees? So the main issue is that asylum seekers do not have legal pathways to arrive in the European uh, Union. And you cannot apply for asylum abroad through, for instance, an embassy. You have to be at the border on the territory of the European Union. So then when there is no legal pathway, the only thing that you can do is to pay smugglers and to be smuggled to the European Union. And this is what happened. People pay fortunes, thousands of thousands of euros 
to come on very unsafe uh, boats, sometimes even dinghies, which are not made for uh, to be used on, on the sea and to cross uh, the Mediterranean. And then, of course, they sink and uh, many people die. So everybody points their finger at smugglers, but in a way, the regulation fits this system. Smugglers are important actors and they are the first persons responsible for these uh, tragedies. But of course, if they are smugglers, it means that they are clients for smugglers. And the clients are the migrants who voluntarily embark on those boats. Because once again, the crucial point is that there is no other uh, pathway to arrive in the European Union. There was a lot of debate also on the way the situation was handled, whether Frontex did their job, whether the Greek authorities didn't push things too far. Without going into who was right and who was wrong, what does this all say about the tensions that are growing around this handling of migrants and refugees? Well, it's clear that actually the priority of the European Union is to fight smugglers. Uh, that's uh, true, but that's difficult. And then it's easier to fight irregular migration. And that's the main goal of the European Union. Contrary to what the member states say, it's not to save lives at sea, because actually we prefer not to send boats, because if we send EU boats, then they are obliged to bring them back to the European Union, because it's impossible in many countries, for instance, like from Libya, to send them back in Libya because there it would be a violation of the principle of no refoulement. So actually, Europeans, they don't send boats anymore for safe and rescue in order to avoid to be obliged to bring the persons back. Now, in this case, there was a flight of Frontex, a plane that transferred the information to the rescue coordination center and apparently the Greek one. So Frontex, I think that they did their job. It was a plane. The plane cannot do, of course, safe and rescue of a boat. They had to transfer the information and they did that. Now, about the Greeks, we don't know exactly what happened. Factual, there will be a need to inquire about that, and it will be quite difficult to determine what precisely happened at sea. We see that the southern countries of the European Union, those who are more exposed to getting the boats and getting all the influx of people trying to get into the EU, it's getting harder and harder for them to deal with this pressure and it also becomes a problem for human rights, for equality, or for equal treatment of people. How can we interpret this? And is there a way of reading how the situation is going to evolve? So one of the main reasons why the member states in the South, because they are uh, facing the migrants arriving in the European Union, why they don't want to accept those boasts, it's because legally, because of the Dublin rules, they become responsible for those persons and in particular to examine their asylum application. So if they accept the boat, they become responsible. So they want to avoid the responsibility, so they try to avoid the boat arriving on their territory and to push it either back, either to the territory of another member states. And apparently what could have happened is that the Greeks, the Greek government, the Greek authorities tried to wait for the boat to go to Italy so that the Italians become responsible. Now that you mentioned Dublin, you give me a good opportunity to ask you a question about the evolution of this regulation and how, after a lot of negotiation, this last June 8th, the Justice and Home Affairs Council announced that it had reached an agreement to modify the Dublin system and that the new asylum and migration management regulation could be a point of guidance for the next council presidency in their negotiations with the European Parliament. The objective being, they said, replacing the much criticized Dublin regulation. What do you think about this new proposal? The new proposal is just a cut and paste of the rules that you find in the Dublin regulation. Uh, 
So actually, the Dublin regulation stays. It survives. It's just going to uh, change from one instrument, the Dublin Tree regulation, to the Asylum Migration Management regulation. But nothing changes, and it means that the burden legally remains on the shoulder of the member states located at the external borders and mainly in the south. There are some points that they highlighted as changes or evolution in this new regulation. In, in the case of Dublin, for instance, a simple take-back notification instead of the take-back procedure. This seems very technical, but what does it mean? Well, uh, the idea is to facilitate the transfers that have to be done on the basis of Dublin, because Dublin is a very bureaucratic and long and difficult uh, procedure. So our idea is to facilitate, to accelerate the transfer between uh, the member states. But actually, there are very few transfers. Dublin doesn't work, so that kind of provision will not uh, help a lot. And we have to wait because this is mainly a proposal from the Council of Ministers, they now have to negotiate with the European Parliament. And there are already voices racing against it because there was no unanimity in the Council anyway. There was no unanimity and then they have now to negotiate with the European Parliament and uh, there will be changes because the Parliament doesn't agree on every point with the Council. So we have to wait in order to see what will be the text that will be finally adopted. Some of the other aspects that the Council highlighted on this text is the idea of a new solidarity mechanism. Did you have an opportunity to take a look at it and do you think this one will work? Because solidarity has been something that has been trying to be put in place for a long time without much success. So that's the very positive aspect of this new regulation that is going to be adopted because finally, for the first time in the history of the migration and asylum policy, there is a real effort to implement the principle of solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility based on different types of measures of solidarity, relocation, meaning the transfer from asylum seekers from countries that are burdened to other uh, countries, financial solidarity between uh, those countries. So this is really very important step in the good direction. But of course, we will have to be seen if this will be applicable and applied in practice for the moment, is black letter law uh, on uh, paper. Will this work in reality? This is something else. But at least it's a positive step in the right direction. There's another point that kind of joins the conversation we were having before about this tragic uh, boat wreck, uh, shipwreck in the Mediterranean, is the idea of mandatory border procedures outside the EU borders. So trying to keep the procedures outside before uh, migrants or asylum seekers reach the European Union. What does it mean? What, what is happening in that direction? Well, it's not outside the territory of the European Union. It is at the borders of the European Union. And what is the idea? Well, that persons will see their claim examined at the border. Their asylum claim will be examined during the time they are at the border. And most probably, they will be detained during that border procedure. And then this avoids that they have access to the territory and then that they can disappear and become illegal migrants and continue their way to other member states in the European Union. So the real willingness is to make sure that people remain at disposal of the authorities at the border in centers that will de facto be detention centers. Is that a big change from what we have today? What does it take to make this possible? Yes, it's a quite important change because nowadays border procedures are not used that much. With the new regulation, they would become mandatory. So that's a big change. So for the moment, people have the possibility to enter the territory as an asylum seeker. They are then on the territory, not that much detained. And then they can continue their way to apply in another uh, member state by circum trying to circumvene the Dublin rules or even to become an illegal migrant and not continuing their asylum procedure. So this caters to those who are are more into a fortress Europe. Let's detain them and not let them in. Do, would you agree with that? 
Yes, uh, one can say indeed that it is a, a step, an effort to build a kind of fortress around the European Union, but a fortress with nevertheless many holes because it's difficult to control all the points of the external borders of the European Union, which is thousands of kilometers long. But it's clear that there is an effort to transform as much as possible into reality a strong control that could lead to something like a European fortress. In practical terms, this means also building a lot of detention centers and dedicating budget to this. This will probably be another source of tensions, I imagine. Yes, that's a, a very important point in practice because, of course, the southern member states that are asked to implement these border uh, procedures will then face the burden of building uh, those centers, having the necessary equipment, having the necessary staff to manage those procedures. And there, the solidarity mechanism that is envisaged doesn't cover the border procedure. It's only for the asylum policy, not the borders policy. And then the important question is, will the southern member states play the game? Will they, in reality, be willing to do this or even be able to do this? And that's a question mark for the future. And if they are not able to do this, then the old policy will uh, break and we are going most probably to enter into a total disorder as we have seen during the crisis of 2015-16. What do you expect the negotiations with the parliament to be like in the upcoming months? It depends on which piece of legislation you are thinking of. Uh, about uh, Yes, because there are two different ones that came out of this negotiation, right? Even more than uh, two, there is really a set. The most important uh, for the moment are the Solidarity and Dublin regulation, which is called the AMMR, the Asylum Migration Management Regulation, and then on the other hand, the Asylum Procedure Regulation. On the AMMR, the views between the Parliament and the Council are not that different. There are, of course, some differences, but it seems possible without too many difficulties to find an agreement. The same is not true for asylum uh, procedures, because there, for instance, the Council wants mandatory procedures at the border for member states, and the Parliament says no voluntary border procedures. So regarding this second piece of legislation, it will be much more difficult to find an agreement. Despite that, we may think that now with the new dynamic that we have observed during the last week with the position taken by the Parliament and by the Council, that the machine started to work and that rules will be adopted and the objective is to have them adopted before the next elections. After 2015, we have seen in 2022 the biggest flow of migrants, this time coming from Ukraine. Uh, but what are the prospects, the next steps, when this temporary protection comes to an end? We're talking about millions of people. Indeed, uh, for the moment, uh, we have around 4 million of Ukrainians registered under the temporary protection scheme that can last for a maximum of three years. So it means from 2022, the day the war broke up, till uh, uh, March 2025. And then after 2025, there is no temporary protection anymore. And uh, people are then supposed either to go back to Ukraine. If the conditions are given. Of course, if it is possible. Nobody knows if this will or, or not be possible. Or the other solution is that then they have to apply for asylum and then they will be treated like any normal asylum seeker, meaning that an individual file will be opened for each of them and will be examined. And hopefully we won't see them in tents like we're seeing the other asylum seekers on the streets. Probably not, because they found already a shelter. What is interesting is to see that some of them found reception conditions, but due to private actors. So there is a phenomenon of privatization that can be observed uh, at the occasion of the implementation of the temporary protection. But probably that Ukrainians will not be in a bad situation, but it will be necessary to find solution to process 
their uh, claim as a group because it would not make sense. It would sense. be incredible bureaucracy that will be completely impossible to implement. Indeed. I mean, uh, what would be it the sense years. of opening uh, 4 million files for persons for whom, in most cases, the answer will be positive? So uh, probably that then one can I imagine to find solutions uh, by a collective answer provided by the administration. Maybe that also at European level it will be necessary to adopt legislation under emergency to provide a solution after the temporary protection. Thank you so much, Professor De Broeker, for helping us make sense of this topic that is very complex, but that will certainly be part of the EU's agenda in the upcoming months. With this episode, we close the first season of Making Sense of EU that was focused on inequality and the European Union. We will be back in September with a new series on the challenges liberal democracy faces in the European Union, and we'll continue to try and make sense of the EU together. Thank you for listening, for your questions and comments, and for sharing. Have a nice summer. Thank you. Making sense of EU.